Okay, a bit closer. I've got a soft voice. I'll shift it this way. Tēnā koutou katoa, ko Lisa Mitchua ho, noa Aotearoa o. Traditionally, photographic history in Aotearoa New Zealand has not paid much attention to the work of women and indigenous makers of photography. There was a perception that Māori, the indigenous people of Aotearoa New Zealand, did not take photographs. And the small number of women that were mentioned fitted into two categories. The photographer's wife, a deeply ambiguous role in relation to colonial photography, or the exceptional woman, Elizabeth Pullman, fits this description. The absence of work by women photographers has also extended to a lack of collecting of their work by galleries, museums and archives. Feeling restless about the prospect of writing and exhibiting the work of yet another white male colonial photographer, and inspired by a notion of curatorial activism and the work of Val Williams, especially her book, The Other Observers, I embarked on a research project about 10 years ago to find out what else there was to know about photography and how it had operated in my country prior to 1960. In tandem with research, I have been acquiring historical photographs by women photographers into the National Museum collection. I soon discovered that the participation of women in um, our, our photography history was a hidden one and one lacking in her stories. Building on a list of names numbering around 20, I now have a data set of just under 500 names of women who contributed to photography in Aotearoa, New Zealand prior to 1960. The definition has changed too from a view of photographic history in Aotearoa that focused only on the work of a select number of male settler photographers and the role their work played in selling and promoting the colony during the 19th and early 20th centuries, what I term the takers. I now prefer to think of photo photography as an ecosystem of makers contributing to a myriad of types, styles and business demands for an array of photographic expressions and products, all within the context of colonisation. Aotearoa New Zealand was a colony of Britain from 1841 to 1907. My book, Through Shaded Glass, Women in Photography in Aotearoa New Zealand, 1860 to 1960, was published last year and features 190 women and draws on years of primary research locating names, photographs and researching lives. It explores photographic practice where women have made strong contributions and which have typically been sidelined or overlooked in photographic histories, such as collaborative working practices, photographers in the Second World War, particularly refugee photographers displaced to Aotearoa, non-binary practices and the involvement of wahine Māori photographers making early work, um, wahine Māori women. A small exhibition was mounted in the art gallery in the Museum Te Papa to celebrate the publication of the book, and these are just some quick views of it. I'm now working with some Wikipedians and about to learn to be one myself to publish the data set and load it into Wikipedia. Bringing a discussion of women in photography from Aotearoa to this private wider platform also had me reflecting on the way this internal national issue of hidden histories replicates within a global context. Here is Anna, <laughs> Anna Fox um, introducing the second Fast Forward Conference in 2017. Um, uh, you can see Aotearoa New Zealand down there, down the bottom, I've put a yellow arrow on us. Um, just out of scope, or perhaps half in, um, by default, due perhaps to the circle around Australia. Um, the traditional centre, um, by which I mean the UK, Europe and the US for us, um, can't control and define all the stories and histories of photography. While we are other to you, you are other to us. Um, so I'm really delighted to be here and help you expand that circle and <laughs> hope you are. Um, it's been a good couple of years for photography from Aotearoa, New Zealand. For the first time, our photographic history has been included in not just one, but two international surveys of photography. The photographers included are all 19th and early 20th century Pākehā, by that are European woman, Elizabeth Pullman, Helen Stewart, 
Margaret Matilda White and Una Garlick. And of the four photographs included to represent their practice, three are portraits of Māori subjects, and the other by Garlick, a scene of native trees. So effectively all depicting the exotic, if you like. This is great. Um, photography from the Antipodes, Oceanic, Pacific region has been disregarded for too long and valued only for its exotic content of indigenous Māori culture. Ethnographic and touristic images have been produced, displayed, collected, and still circulate internationally on the collector's market, propping up and romanticizing colonial narratives. In what appears otherwise to be a great resource, the two Aotearoa New Zealand entries in the book were grouped in with and written about by an Australian-based academic. Please don't do this. We can speak for ourselves. Um, the writer interprets Pullman and White's photographs being more sympathetic, apparently granting their Māori subjects, quote, unusual subjectivity and dignity simply because they were women and not male photographers. I don't agree. This is a portrait by Elizabeth Pullman's studio of an unknown Māori wahine woman. The context of its production is unknown, but she appears to have a blanket probably draped over her clothing, suggesting a photographer's type portrait rather than a portrait she has commissioned herself. Her moko kawe, chin tattoo, possibly was the attraction for the photographer. The text also repeats and expands into an international context, the now incorrect assertion that Pullman was, quote, New Zealand's first female professional photographer. Here, Helen Stewart takes her place in a prestigious select lineup featured here on a prominent book sales website. Um, along with the likes of Julia Margaret Cameron, Ma Madame Yvonne, Walker Evans and Diane Albras. Um, for someone like me, this is slightly humorous and also quite magical. Um, this portrait was possibly one of eight Māori portraits exhibited in the fine arts section of the Colonial and Indio exhibition in London in 1886 and would have played a part in helping to bring the ethnographic exhibits in the nearby New Zealand court to life by romanticising Māori stereotypes. Stuart immigrated from Britain to Aotearoa in 1859 and became part of a movement of Pākehā or European settlers whose work created a genre of art and culture expressions termed Māori land, producing romanticised imagery of what they believed to be a dying race of people. The Colonial and Indian Exhibition catalogue on the right gives a list of names as titles for the portraits. However, most of them have spelling mistakes or just make no sense as Māori names, leading me to wonder if they were made up, which is entirely plausible. Stuart's portraits were popular in London and all were sold to buyers during the exhibition. Stuart's portraits of non-Indigenous subjects tended to be individuals in the public sphere whose names went with their portraits. However, as the product of a colonial culture and gaze, Stuart's painted portraits of Māori, in particular wahine, remain largely unidentified and emblematic of a cultural type. Uncomfortably, this Māori wahine appears to have been largely understood by Stuart and her audiences only in terms of her cultural difference, her badge of honour as a celebrity. Despite its realism, Stuart's portrait is ambiguous. Stuart applied paint onto photographs, creating works that have a sense of photography's presence, but also hide it. As both painting and photograph of an indigenous subject, the portrait sits in uncertain territory, and we don't know whether it accurately represents the subject or not due to the amount of paint she added to the surface. Whether the wahine whose portrait Stuart used was aware of the subsequent exhibition and sale of the portrait is unknown, but probably not. Stuart's portrait has become both an unintended gift for the subject's descendants, whoever they might be, and a physical embodiment of the effect of colonisation on Indigenous peoples. Captured by a European lens, imported onto land the Wahine and her people had been disenfranchised from by colonisation, the Wahine's likeness is then obscured and romanticised through the application of paint to create a European artefact. As I said, the essay about this portrait in the book was written by myself and it was great to be asked to contribute and with enough time to research the image and investigate the identification that had already been placed on the portrait. This portrait of a woman identified by her descendants as Monica Ruke is held in the National Library of New Zealand and had recently been located and it was found that this was the same woman. 
However, I disagreed. Stuart's portrait is of Kuya, an elderly wahine, and dated 1885, versus Ruke's portrait being of a younger woman taken around the 1890s. But the main point of difference is their mokokoe, or chin tattoo, entirely different designs, reflecting the woman's whanau, or family, and leadership within their respective communities. Thanks to the editors reaching out and checking assumptions, this book went to print without the incorrect attribution of the portrait subject to someone whose descendants actively kaitiaki, mind and care for the memory of their ancestor. Many images of Māori were made by people like Helen Stewart with little regard and care for the subjects they depict. That story might have ended there, except for Māori communities who have taken to the photographic image as an extension of the portrait form traditionally realised within carvings and oral histories. Today, these portraits are revered and honoured, and while the continued European interest in them as exotic and ethnographic keeps them within international markets and at unaffordable prices for descendants, Taking the care to only attribute within a consultation framework is important. Despite the appearance of Māori identities in these two publications, all the photographers from Aotearoa New Zealand are European women with colonial settler identities. Focusing on the photographic work of settler Pākehā European women centralises their viewpoints, but their work is still produced within class and racial biases and structures. Their gender doesn't make these women any less complicit in colonial power dynamics and injustices or enable them to speak on behalf of the subjects depicted in their photographs. While Māori sometimes feature in their work, and they do in these examples, they are not the creators of these images. Being included, constructing and making the image is not the same as being represented or misrepresented in images. My book asserts the following revisionist points, that women have been involved in the history of photography in Aotearoa, New Zealand for over 160 years, and that Māori took photographs and compiled albums from the 19th century onwards, and that wahine Māori made significant contributions. It also takes a know the name, know the story approach, lose or change the name, a process of colonisation, and you lose the story with nothing to prompt the retelling and sharing of knowledge so it can be passed on. This is a page spread from the book with the portrait of Makuriti of Te Arawa, also known as Maggie, pa Maggie Papakura, holding her Kodak autographic camera that was published in 1910 in the Australasian Photo Review. Here, an indigenous woman is the taker of images and possessor of the device for making them. She is still the subject of the image, but this is a shift into the notion that Māori were and are photographers and not just the subjects of photography. On the right is a portrait taken by Makariti, the Tōhonga Tutanakai, possibly with the same camera. It was published in her book, The Old Time Māori, which was published posthumously in 1938. Both images only appear to survive as photomechanical reproductions in these publications and demonstrates the lack of photographic artefacts, negatives and prints by many of these makers. For some early photographers, their work only survives now in publications such as historical newspapers, graphic magazines and books. These portraits are from the Spencer Maxwell album, which was gifted and assembled from 1882. In 1882, Maria Jane Maxwell, who was living in the Hokianga in the north, received the gift of a carte de visite album and portraits from her cousin, Isabella Bella Spencer of Tauranga, approximately 500 kilometres away. Both Maria and Bella belonged to the Ngāiti Rangi Iwi, a tribal group from the Tauranga area. Bella married to a Marriott to a commercial photographer, probably regarded an album as a suitable gift for her younger cousin. It appears that the album came with some portraits already inserted, since it contains portraits of Bella mounted on card and credited as the work of her husband. Most of the portraits in the album are studio images and appear to be of both Bella and Maria and their Fano family and friends. And despite the physical distance between the cousins, the album shows these links remain strong, at least via photography. 
Although there was no evidence that Bella was involved in her husband's photographic studio, it would have been unusual for a wife at this time in the colony not to have been involved in some way in the fledgling business in 1879 and before the birth of the couple's first child in 1881. Albums compiled by Māori, along with the existence of Māori photographers, undermine assumptions that Māori became involved with photography only as the subjects of ethnographic imagery. Personal portraits, with the subjects dressed in their own contemporary clothing, such, in the, such as in these portraits, were assembled into albums and circulated within Fano and among friends. They were popular and differed from the more contrived type portraits produced and sold by photographers. Katarina Hansard of Napui was a professional photographer whose main studio was in the Northland town of Kakohi from 1893 to 1898. It was here during the late 19th century that her surviving photographic work was made. The only vintage photograph I've located so far is this one of a little girl and her doll. There's not much about it to suggest that this is the work of an indigenous woman photographer. The Hansards were typical of couples in colonial New Zealand and that they had numerous businesses and services they offered. And while the studio was branded in her husband's name, archival sources confirmed the studio operators to have been Katarina and her daughter Aneta as her studio assistant. These are reproductions of some of Katarina's photographs and a portrait of her um, from the feature in the 1897 Cyclopedia of New Zealand. The text published along with the photographs describes Katarina's work as, quote, excellent specimens of her skill as a photographer and boasts that her work is equal to the standard of city artists, revealing a tension between the region and centre and ends by describing Katarina and Aneta as proud of their business and as accomplished musicians, points to reassure readers that the pair had adopted European values and qualities. Hansard's photography raises the question of what photographs made by indigenous photographers from the 19th and early 20th centuries might look like, or perhaps what do we expect them to look like. Hansard's photographs are different from ethnographic and exotic tourist imagery and sit within traditional understandings of commercial portraiture and landscape photography. But they also reveal the power of our understanding of the photographic medium to steamroll over differences. Who the photographer is makes these images what they are. <laughs> they are not the point of view of an outsider passing through and recording the landscape as a prospect. Hansard's landscape views showing a coastal rock formation and perhaps her husband, the nearby European settlement of Rawani and the logging industry in Mill Bay, along with her image of a carved part of Kakai, a food storehouse on stilts, are made on her ancestral Fano, the land of her people. She has represented an aspect of her world and the change that it was undergoing. Her portrait of what appears to be a European child taken in a studio on Kaikoui, also the Fenua land of her people, shows like any other 19th century studio portrait, looks like any other 19th century studio portrait, but shows the esteem of her studio in the town and the willingness of non-Maori to go to her for portraits. Wahine Maori engaged in business and commerce in 19th century Aotearoa New Zealand contradictory to how they have been portrayed in ethnographic and touristic imagery. Am I, am I out of time? because you didn't interrupt. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, didn't, okay. I didn't want to interrupt you before and say you have two minutes, so okay. it's all gone. But um, thank you very much for this fascinating research-based work. Thank you very much. Oh,